So I'd like to thank everybody for coming to our Inspiring Optimism and Heart Valves Patient Program. So this is our, our fourth version of this. We've done it uh, three other times throughout the metro and, and happy to be here in uh, Lakeville speaking to you all. I'm Ross Garbrick. I work for the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. Um, and I have the opportunity to partner with a lot of the people that are in this room today to help advance heart disease research. So I'm partnering with patients, some of you who are in here, our physicians who you're gonna hear from later, our industry partners in the back who uh, graciously support this event and also brought some of the uh, nifty new tech that they have for you guys to take a look at. Um, and then most importantly, the, the clinical staff that we work with to help deliver that care. And so I want to start out just by thanking everybody for spending your Saturday here, giving us a couple hours of your time, and then also to our industry partners, Abbott, Edwards Life Science, and Medtronic for sponsoring this event uh, and also having some exhibits for it. And so quick schedule on this, I'll give you a little intro on MHIF and MHI as a practice. We have a great patient story to hear. You're going to hear from a couple of our experts and our heart team who uh, also help treat that patient. And then at the end, um, you'll hear from our clinical staff, and then we have a round robin, actually, a panel of physicians who will be up here. So throughout the event, you'll notice there's some little cards on your table. If you have a question, write it down on the note card. We have three staff throughout the uh, event, John, Maya, and Heather, who will come and actually pick it up from you. And then at the end, the physicians will take a run through those cards and try to answer those questions for you. And so a little bit on the Heart Institute Foundation. So we are 42 years old this year. Um, and as we describe ourselves, we always think back to our founder, Bob Van Tassel, who was a, a physician who started the foundation, and his vision was you can't think big enough. And so he was always pushing that boundary of innovation, excellence, quality, moving all of that forward. And a year after they started the clinical practice, they started the foundation, and they made it separate from the healthcare system and separate from the practice. So it gave us the ability to be agile. Um, and, and take the necessary risks that we need to take and move things forward in an expedited fashion. And through all of that, it really drives some of the passion that we have in our staff, our physicians, our patients, and it's been a, a great opportunity to deliver impact to our patients. And most importantly, you know, we're always working for options for our patients and providing excellent quality results for everybody. So I think that's a, a great slide that describes who we are. So, we have two arms to the foundation. We do research, we also do education. So this would be considered one of our educational events. Um, we are physicians of about 120, give or take, um, throughout Minneapolis and St. Paul that provide education and research for patients. We have 45 sites that we partner with with Alina that's in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. Um, and so what you'll see is, despite us being separate from Alina or MHI, we have a very close partnership and, and a great working relationship between all three groups of ours. And so just giving you an idea of what these two arms of MHIF's research look like, we have uh, a picture of our research team here on the right, and that is uh, one of the first transcatheter valve procedures um, that was done. So at any given time, we've got about 220 studies. Um, we catch about 2,200 patients a year and uh, a little over 3,000 patient visits a year that come through the foundation. And then on the other arm, we have education, and that's our summer internship program that you'll see there. So that's aspiring physicians that we bring in who are upcoming junior, seniors uh, in college that are interested in pursuing careers in medicine. And so we've had about 235 interns come through the foundation over our almost 22-year program now, 80% um, of which are either on track to become a physician or are a practicing physician. The other 15%, uh, similar to myself, are in a healthcare field but may not be a, a, a practicing physician. So great to see our mission there. And then last uh, but not least, thank you to the uh, generosity of our, our exhibitors, our patients, and everybody else. So the foundation is an independent nonprofit. We operate on industry revenue for enrolling patients, grants, and then philanthropy as well. So thank you for everybody who's made a donation. And so just a couple of housekeeping items. You will notice the, uh, the, the uh, uh, notepads on your table, so any questions, write those down. On the agenda that was out today, there's a QR code that you can use. So we're always looking for feedback on how we can improve these events. So um, if you're able to pull that up, it gives you the option to fill out a survey on what went well, what could go better, where are the opportunities to improve. Um, and then finally, um, we're going to hear a story prior to our physician panel coming up of 
uh, Mr. Del Kempfert. So he's a native of Niswa, which is north of the city, he's a couple hours. Um, wasn't, wasn't feeling the greatest, saw his local cardiologist up there who referred him down to the heart team at United. Um, and so you'll actually hear from a couple members of his heart team here shortly, um, but we will show the, the story of Daryl. I'm Daryl Kempfert, and uh, we live in Niswa, Minnesota. Last summer, we have a circle here, and we'd walk the circle, and I'd start having to stop going, my heart's beating pretty fast, and I'm breathing hard. So Daryl has such a remarkable story, and it is one that I think is representative of so many of our patients. During the course of the summer, again, I started noticing, I'm not working all that hard on the deck, but I'm breathing pretty hard again. Daryl had started feeling symptoms several months prior to when we met him. He felt that, you know, he was just getting older and that this was something that he may have to live with. But luckily and fortunately, his team of doctors in his small hometown were able to refer him to Alina and to us. He said, Daryl, you have a murmur, a heart murmur. I said, what? A heart murmur? What in the world would cause a heart murmur? He said, well, generally, it's a defective valve. His mitral valve was leaking, and when that leaks, it goes backwards to the lungs, to the belly, to the legs. So when we think about valve disease, I always explain to patients, valves are like doors. They should completely open and completely close. We have two options for any uh, cardiac problem. One is the traditional open heart surgery, and the second one is the percutaneous option. Percutaneous option means option coming from the groin uh, in a minimally basic way. We operate very much so as a multidisciplinary heart team here, and we don't consider one patient as only surgical or only cardiology and interventional, and we really truly try to come up with the best treatment options for our patients. In this specific case, he had a prior open heart surgery, so and we always look for alternative access. That's, that's why we referred the patient to Dr. Soria for evaluation, and uh, she found that he was a great uh, percutaneous option candidate. It's our responsibility to explain what the pathway looks like from an open surgical standpoint, a minimally invasive transcatheter standpoint, what the risks, benefits, recovery looks like for both. If somebody said, we need to put a clip on your valve and we're not going to open you up to do it, it's like, wait a minute, how could you possibly put a valve a clip on a valve and you're not going to cut me open and stop my heart to grab that and put it on. Almost impossible, but not. It's not impossible. That's how far we've come. We were able to fix that leaking valve by putting what I call a, a paper clip like device to essentially bring the hinges of the door together to help reduce that leakiness. And we were able to do that without opening up his chest. And the one thing I noticed when I came out of the anesthesia with the valve, I noticed I could breathe better within minutes of coming out of that procedure. We got a phenomenal result in reducing the leakiness on his valve. And most importantly, in follow-up, he feels amazing and is back to his life now. A great deal of comfort came from them explaining how the heart works. And I had a lot of questions and I asked them and they just took the time to listen to me and my concerns and answered every one of them. In general, after doing a transcatheter procedure, we generally say take it easy for about a week with all the precautions from an access standpoint. Generally, patients can get back to their routine and their life and really with the help of cardiac rehab, they really can do whatever they'd like to do from an activity standpoint. And that's really one of the best feelings as a physician to see how quickly patients feel better. Before, I could go from one level to the main level, the basement to the main level, and I would have to stop before I went to the third level and just take a second, let your heart settle down, then continue on. Now I can go back and forth. And usually when I get down, I do a back flip or two and land on my feet and go, hallelujah to Dr. Sodi. His story and so many of our patients' stories, I think, exemplify how it's important to pay attention as a, as a patient 
to how you're feeling, how you're doing, and being an active participant in your healthcare. And it is okay to come and get evaluated and even just understand the options. I hope that he has many, many uh, fulfilling years to come. And I hope that we can continue to take care of patients like Daryl to get them really back to their lives and, and uh, back to, to what they you know, enjoy doing. I used to play golf and the beautiful thing of this area is we're surrounded by lakes and we're surrounded by golf courses. And I'm gonna go back to golfing and pickleball. I think that's in the future as well. And we're gonna enjoy the deck. We're gonna be grilling this summer. So I'm looking forward to that. So a uh, great story from Daryl, and uh, we're fortunate to have his, his uh, art team here today. And so I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Nish Thasodi to the stage. Thanks, Ross. Yeah. Well, thank you guys very much. And you know, this is, that video just in captures why I love what I get to do. So welcome and thank you guys so much for joining us today. We really, really, truly are, are happy that you guys are here and, and at this opportunity to talk about Valve Awareness Day. My name is Nishta Sodi. I'm a structural and interventional cardiologist and the director of the Structural Heart Program at the United Campus in St. Paul. So welcome. Uh, February 22nd is National Heart Valve Awareness Day, and here at MHI, we wanted to put this program in anticipation of this day to really help spread the awareness of valve disease. So welcome. We want to make this as interactive as possible, and we're really so thrilled that you guys are all here today. So we'll start and talk about what is heart valve disease. So the heart has four major valves, and when we think about valves, as I talked about in the video, we think about them like doors. Valves should completely open and completely close, just like a door should. And when a heart valve or a door doesn't open up as it should, that is what we call stenosis, and as a result of that, blood can't leave the heart all the way like it should. And in the exact opposite pro problem, when the heart or the uh, door, the valve, can't close all the way, it's a leaky valve or a leaky door. And as a result of that, the blood is gonna leak and go backwards. And oftentimes that fluid goes backwards to the lungs, to the belly, and to the legs, and people can have congestive heart failure symptoms. And that is what our patient Daryl had, uh, as he talked about. And so we'll talk here about uh, a few of the valves. There's four major ones, and we'll start with the aortic valve. And you can see on the left side, this is what a normal valve or a normal aortic door looks like. It's completely opening and completely closing. In contrast, when the valve gets stenotic with calcium, that door or valve cannot open all the way because of that calcification and blood as a result can't leave the heart all the way. And when that happens, patients can manifest with symptoms like shortness of breath, chest pain, feeling lightheaded, like they're going to pass out, or have irregular heart rhythms. And we traditionally think about open heart surgery as the treatment option for patients with valve disease. But as you heard with Daryl's story, now in 2024, we have an abundant and breadth of transcatheter options, which simply means minimally invasive options to help repair or replace a heart valve without opening up the chest. And so this is one example of that procedure where we're actually replacing an aortic valve through a procedure called transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR. And we're replacing this patient's valve without opening up the chest, going up through the leg artery. Now when we take a look at the mitral valve, this is the, the pathology that Daryl had. Mitral regurgitation or leakiness on the mitral valve is fairly common. And in fact, there's a prevalence of nearly 10% in patients that are greater than 75 years of age. And when you see these pictures here, you can take a look just visually, all of that yellow, light blue mixture that you see is blood that's going backwards. It's leaking backwards to the lungs and to, backwards to the belly, to the legs. And so the way that we think about repairing this 
uh, pathology is, again, what I described in the video, a paperclip-like device. We have two options to really help bring the hinges of the door together to reduce the leakiness. And you can see after that uh, uh, device is on the valve, that leakiness or blood going backwards has greatly been reduced. We look at our other two valves, the pulmonic valve and the tricuspid valve, and similarly, we have options there as well. And so when we take a look at all of these four heart valves, how common is it to, for someone to have valve disease? And the answer is it's quite common, more than five million people in the United States. And if we think about patients and survival who do have this, you would think you know, breast cancer patients or prostate cancer patients may have worse survival, when in fact, valve disease patients have a far more malignant course and we can treat it. And so when we think about this, it's a huge problem of just being aware. And if we take a look and sort of think to yourself and guess, out of 10 patients that have valvular heart disease, how many do you guys think might be getting treated in the United States, even in 2024? Close, less than a third. So that's the vast minority of patients. And so it's so important that we have programs like today to help increase awareness. And, and for patients, we always say, as I mentioned, to be aware of your symptoms and make sure that you relay that to your physicians who can get you to an appropriate team. We're lucky that we have a very multidisciplinary heart team, many of whom you're going to hear later today. Our surgical colleague, Dr. Olivares, Dr. Vudros over at our Abbott Northwestern campus. And this team includes our imaging specialists and then very much equally important, our whole members with our coordinators. You're gonna hear from Carrie Heimstra, our other excellent coordinator, Jess Timmerman, uh, our schedulers, Danielle. Many of our team is here and all of these members of the team come together to figure out what does this patient need, how do we get them worked up, and what is their best treatment option. Sometimes that treatment option does include continuing medical therapy alone. Sometimes that includes a minimally invasive transcatheter uh, treatment option. Sometimes that includes open heart surgery with Dr. Olivares. And sometimes that means a unique clinical trial option, which Ross and the MHI Foundation will talk to you guys about later today. This is our heart team over uh, in St. Paul, so a shout out to them, many of whom are here. We cannot do what we do um, without every single one of our uh, very large and multidisciplinary team. And it, we're fortunate at Alina that we have various sites. Uh, of course, at St. Paul, we have our, our valve clinic there. Dr. Vudros is over on the west side at Abbott Northwestern, and then we have an additional team up north at Mercy. And so with that, I, I just want to, again, welcome you all. We are very thrilled that you guys are here. And please, if there's any questions, feel free to, to jot them out down throughout the day, and uh, we will make sure we answer them. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce next my surgical colleague, partner, uh, and friend, uh, Dr. Gabe Olivares, who comes uh, to us via Chile and the Cleveland Clinic. And as someone who also trained at the Cleveland Clinic, we have that special bond. And he's just an all-time fantastic, uh, humble person. You would never guess that uh, he is this renowned and very brilliant uh, and highly skilled cardiac surgeon. So with that, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha, for, for your kind words. Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabriel Olivares. I'm one of the cardiac surgeons at United, and um, thank you for being here. After your heart problem is diagnosed, might be a narrow aortic valve or might be a leaky mitral valve, you have to understand we are going to try to achieve two main goals. One, is going to improve your symptoms or quality of life, and second one is going to improve your survival. And that is the main two reasons why we intervene about problems. Right before your journey starts, um, you are going to meet our heart team. Uh, it's a great and dedicated group of nurses, uh, cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, and of course, surgeons. And there's three main imaging tests that we're going to require to make the best recommendation possible. One is called echocardiogram or ultrasound. 
you can see there, is a non-invasive ultrasound that we are able to see your valve and your heart function. The second important imaging test is going to be the CT scan, and you can see there uh, how we are able to see your heart. We're able to see your valves, how much calcium your valve has, what is the size of your valve, and what are your vascular access um, for potential uh, minimal invasive approach, as, such as transcatheter options. And the last one is an invas invasive uh, imaging test called angiogram, and we are able to assess your coronary arteries, those arteries providing blood to your heart. And this is, a, this is an invasive uh, uh, imaging testing done through your arm. After we put all together your clinical aspect and all your imaging tests, we're going to meet. It's called the structural meeting, valve meeting, valve conference. We meet every week, and as you can see there, nurses, cardiologists, radiologists, uh, interventional cardiologists and surgeons uh, looking for the best option for your heart problem. And some considerations that we usually do uh, before making any important recommendations. Uh, obviously, we take in consideration your preference. Uh, we, we do what is called chair decision making process where we heard all the opinion of the expert and also your preference. Um, we consider your age, um, your medical history, if you have any important medical conditions, uh, what is your risk of surgery? And what is the valve anatomy? Is this uh, valve problem amenable to treat to transcatheter option or minimal invasive way? Generally speaking, those are the main difference. Of course, uh, open heart surgery, surgery is an invasive procedure, requires an incision, general anesthesia, and connect to the heart lung machine. You're going to spend five or seven days in the hospital after the procedure, and the full recovery process may take two and three months. Transcatheter options, non-invasive options, are uh, you don't require any incision. Uh, most of the procedures are done under sedation. You don't need the heart lung machine. You're going to face a short hospitalization and a rapid uh, recovery process. So at this point, uh, most of the patients like the idea to get a transcatheter option. Uh, with this faster recovery process and less invasive option. But there's a few very important surgical considerations, such as your age. Maybe you are younger enough. Uh, you may need more procedures down the road, so it's very important to do the right thing at the beginning. You may have atrial fibrillation, um, and during the open heart surgery, we may address uh, what is called maze or an ablation to take care of your irregular heartbeats and decreasing the risk of a stroke down the road. You may have important, important coronary artery disease, such as artery blockage and your arteries. You might be best served by surgery. Your aorta might be, might be a little bit dilated, and we can also take care during the open heart surgery. You may not have a normal aortic valve, what is called bicuspid aortic valve, it's a valve with just two doors or two leaflets that might be severely calcified, and those patients are better served by surgery. Or you may have multiple valve disease in that situation. Uh, you might be also a better candidate for a, for a surgical repair. Well, after we made the decision which one is the best treatment for you, you're going to res receive um, uh, important uh, instruction preoperatively. Um, you were going to take care of your medications, what to bring uh, during the day of the procedure, what time to arrive, what to do before your procedure. The day of the procedure, uh, you're going to be with one of your family members. You're going to um, uh, register with the receptionist, giving all the information for contact later. We're going to provide all kinds of instructions um, Keep in touch with the receptionist for any update from the OR. Um, one of our nurses is going to pick you up from the uh, waiting room. 
This is a pre-op area where we change all your street clothes to the hospital gowns. All the patient needing any heart procedure is going to require IV access. You're going to meet the rest of the team. The rest of the team, such as anesthesiologists, they're going to ask you some questions about your medical conditions, about allergy, and finally, undergoing to the procedure. It could be open heart surgery or transcatheter options. This is where the action happens. This is the cat lab. Um, you can see there's a, there is a special bed, odd bed, and you can see um, at, at the end of the picture, uh, there is the x-ray equipment, and you can see the screen the monitor where the, the interventional cardiologist can, can, uh, can do uh, all the interventions that are needed. There is Dr. Sori uh, getting what is called getting access to your uh, femoral vessels to the groin. She's able to manipulate small wires into your groin, and then she can see the screen there. And transcatheter options therapies are very unique. Uh, surgeons and card interventional cardiologists work together. Um, and this is a picture uh, where we are placing a new uh, aortic valve. They usually the largest room in the hospital when we can accommodate all the equipment, uh, all the screens. We can check your vital signs, ultrasounds uh, through the uh, screen. We use very different size catheter, needles, wires. There's not only anesthesiologists, interventional cardiologists and surgeons, also um, um, imaging cardiologists checking the echo, making sure that everything is okay. We can see, again, the vital signs, the ultrasounds, and what's happening on the screen. That is one of the type of valve that we use to do this aortic valve procedure. Dr. Sauri is deploying there one of the aortic valve. If the... Uh, if the treatment uh, chosen was uh, is uh, open heart surgery, we do need to understand that we need to spread your breastbone or your sternum. We can do it in two ways. One is on the on the left side. One is called full sternotomy, and that requires opening the whole the whole bone. And the other option is maybe using minimally invasive uh, alternative uh, to speed up the recovery process and uh, patient experience less pain and a better healing process. So during the surgery, we are able to take all the calcium out of your valve, clean it up, and place in a new, a new valve. And, and that picture, there is a picture of the uh, pericardial aortic valve uh, coming from a, from a cow. Uh, it's made with, the, uh, with a sac that is around the heart called pericardium. And you can see there, those are the surgical stitches that we usually use to do this replacement. And this is an everyday case in our hospital. Um, nurses, scrub nurse, perfusionists, anesthesiologists, physician assistants participate, taking care of you. We combine classic surgical technique with new technology to try to make a safe this surgery possible. That is the Harlan machine that we use, we use for, to do this surgery. We, we have all kind of monitor to make this surgery safe. There is one of my partners, Dr. Stefan, doing uh, an aortic valve replacement using these special loops to be very precise with every movement. After surgery, this next day after surgery, you're going to be able to stand up, incorporate. Um, one of the respiratory therapies is going to um, uh, do with you some breathing exercise. We're making sure that you're receiving the right treatment, making sure that your pain is under control, your blood sugar is under control, um, checking on you very frequently. Um, obviously, if you're undergoing for a transcatheter option, you might be at home next, on maybe in the next two days. Um, 
it's very important to uh, dissipation with the second day post-surgery, uh, doing some breathing exercises. And some patients, very active patient, might start rehab process immediately after surgery if the pain is under control, wa walking with our thera uh, physical therapies. If you are weak after surgery, you might require transitional unit cares. Uh, our social workers are going to take care of that situation. Um, most of the time, your family member can be with you in the, in the room after the surgery. We have a spiritual care team, physical care team, taking care of your post-operative course. <coughs> Rehab process can, can start as soon as one or two weeks after the charge, after open heart surgery. With the transcatheter option, you can start even sooner than that. You won't be alone during this journey. Uh, and Dr. Sawyer and I are representing our team, a dedicated group of health care providers, nurses, cardiologists, surgeons, making sure that you are, taking, you, are, you are receiving the best care possible. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Olivares. And I think all of the videos that uh, Dr. Olivares was, was able to show really, I think, exemplify how many people are involved. And it's not just one physician or, or two physicians. It's really a whole team. Um, and that team includes our outstanding nurses. My nurse here, Mandy Trollson, is here with us today. And it is all of us, part of the whole team, that help us get a patient through that journey. Sometimes that journey is a transcatheter procedure, minimally invasive, and sometimes that's open heart surgery like Dr. Oliveras mentioned and described just now. But another option for patients is sometimes a unique clinical trial. And these clinical trials oftentimes are sometimes the patient's only last hope. We're very fortunate at Alina to have that foundation, MHIF, here with us. And as a part of that, we have access and opportunity to a breadth of very unique transcatheter clinical trials. Some of those are replacement technologies on the various valves. Some are repair technologies. And we're very fortunate because clinical trials are often only offered at very select sites in the United States, if not the country. And we're very fortunate that we have this opportunity at MHIF. Sometimes uh, patients, this is their only last hope and is the way that they finally get to feeling better. With that, I'd like to invite Ross uh, to come up as representation from our foundation, as well as our fantastic uh, valve coordinator, Carrie Heimstra. Again, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be able to speak here on behalf of our team, and I'm so thrilled that you're all here to learn more about um, heart, uh, valvular heart disease. Um, again, I am uh, one of the valve coordinators um, for our site at United. All right, thanks, Carrie. Coley, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. She uh, is under the weather, but she's our nurse coordinator who actually um, oversees our entire transcatheter um, and structural heart procedure portfolio. So she manages uh, a team of about half a dozen individuals that have um, in the ballpark of about 15 different studies in valvular heart disease that we're doing. Um, and so just by a, a quick show of hands, um, has anybody here ever participated in a clinical research trial? So a new audience, this is, oh, we got a couple. Okay, all right, so um, we'll, we'll kind of walk you through the process of what that looks like, um, also what the benefits of that are, um, and just maybe provide some awareness on um, what types of studies we do at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. And so like I said before, um, about 40 years of doing sponsored clinical trials, um, the TAVR that you see now that you're in the hospital for a day or two for and then discharged, 
um, started about 12 years ago only. So that's how far we've come in basically the last decade on transcatheter valves. Um, those started in an extremely sick patient population. So basically uh, not a candidate for surgery due to either atomical reasons or just the risk was so high. So we started in patients that, that were very, very, very sick um, and we continue moving that down the ladder uh, and making it available to more and more patients. So that's kind of what the, the pathway looks like there. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit on what's clinical research, um, what's in, why is it important to the patients, and then also what's the process to participate in this, uh, and then Carrie will give some uh, information on kind of how that folds in with all the clinical aspects of, of care as well. And so a clinical trial uh, generally is an interventional procedure where they're comparing two different arms. Um, they, can be very con they can be very new devices, so EFS, sometimes they're comparing um, a brand new device to the standard of care, um, all the way down to relatively straightforward things where maybe there's two different um, pathways that you can take that are both clinically approved, and we're trying to figure out which, which patient should go which pathway at which point. So we span the full spectrum of, of clinical trials at the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, um, and not only on devices, but medications alike, um, also processes within the hospital. So, when I say 220 studies at any given time, it's not all brand new devices and drugs. A lot of these are taking existing things and figuring out how do we optimize them as well. Um, so why is clinical research important? Uh, number one is, is advancing that science. So we're able to move things forward. We're able to provide more options for, for patients, more treatment um, options. Once they're approved, they get rolled out to a wider population as well. So it may start in a few select hospitals, but when it becomes commercially approved, we're able to push those out then uh, and nationally. Um, you know, I think that the other piece about this that we hear from patients is, you know, we, we were told by our cardiologists we probably have, you know, in extreme cases, months or weeks left to live. A device comes on the market that, that allows them to enroll in a clinical trial. Um, we have a, a patient who received a, a new mitral valve that was told less than two months. Um, a couple months ago, he celebrated his ninth anniversary of having the device implanted. So there, there, there's big options here, um, you know, and, and he was able to see five new grandchildren. So that's kind of the big piece of, of benefiting those generations to come. Um, and then just expanding the use and, and testing the therapy. So even when they're approved, um, a lot of our industry partners in the back will do post-marketing trials. So we'll follow long-term. So it's not just getting it approved and we, it's there now and we stop learning about it. We're still continuing to follow it. We're trying to figure out when the right times for interventions are, who the right patient population is, and, and really keep driving that forward. And so, you know, I think this, this greatly summarizes why clinical research is important to patients. It gives us access to novel therapies that, that many times we wouldn't have otherwise. It gives uh, an active role in your personal care, so speak up and, and involves the patients, lets them make some decisions along the way as well, bringing our future generations together. And then finally, uh, you're dealing with some great physicians and, and hospital staff to help drive these pieces. So with that, I'm gonna let Carrie give a brief overview of how it folds into our clinical care. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly do an overview of the difference between research being a, in a clinical research study versus that of traditional medical treatment. Um, in a clinical research, the main intent focuses on getting answers um, through research with numerous people in that, in that set, um, uh, research um, participants. In traditional medical therapy, we're looking at the needs of you as a specific individual. Um, you are the intended patient, um, as well as the benefit to you is for the individual. And in um, a research clinical trial, again, it's generally designed for the intent to benefit future patients, such as yourselves. Um, funding is um, governed um, with a research trial by or is supported by the manufacturer or the research organization. And of course, if you're traditional therapy, it goes through you yourself and your insurance carrier. So that's the big difference there. Um, consent um, is, um, part of a research trial, um, meaning that it's required written informed consent to be part of this. Although it's voluntary, we need that written consent. And in the traditional um, workup for a standard of care therapy, um, it's just a discussion between you and your doctor. This is your disease process. Um, here are the options available, and then we kind of move forward from there. 
As far as treatment, again, the treatment is um, in a research uh, arm is for evaluation for future and typically always not available to anybody else unless you are part of this um, research study. And for traditional medical therapy, these are procedures that have already been approved. So um, they're available to us, those treatments and procedures. Um, and then again, as far as release of findings um, in an, um, a standard care medical treatment, these are private. Your records are not shared with anybody except for you and your provider. Um, where in a research clinical trial, um, the results are collected, that data is analyzed, and then it is published um, in the medical journals or even sometimes at um, medical conferences such as this. So what do you need to know or how does that process take place and how do you get involved in research? Well, currently we have two, uh, two active um, studies at United that we're involved in and so I just thought I'd run you through what that looks like and how we collaborate with research. So once we get a referral, we're already starting that process of evaluating you, the patient, your past medical history, um, and looking to see if you qualify, what your eligibility is, do you fit the criteria. Um, then it involves you coming in for a consult with either, um, with one of our four interventionalists like Dr. Sodi and meeting with one of our surgeons like Dr. Olivares. Um, from there, the doctor and you will have a conversation about your disease process, what your best option tr treatment options are for you as you move forward, and then we move on to if they determine you're eligible and you're willing to participate. Again, this is a voluntary, um, uh, voluntary research is voluntary. So um, then I kind of get my team involved. So Coley or Grant um, are who I work with at United. Um, I give them a call or a staff message saying, hey, we've got this patient that fits the criteria. I think they would be a great candidate. They're interested in meeting with you to move forward um, or see if they still want to move forward. And so that's where the informed consent comes in. You meet with um, our research team at that point. Um, they go through the details of the study and answer all of your questions about what it entails, what it looks like. Um, along this whole process, this journey that you're on, our team is collaborating together. So you are part of the structural heart team. Research is involved. We are going back and forth to collaborate to figure out what diagnostic testing is needed, um, what um, needs to be scheduled. And again, all of those tests and procedures are done through, um, we're collaborating with each other. So we're typically saying, hey, we've got this done or we need this done. Um, and then from there, we move forward to, if you move forward into the research um, um, arm of things, um, getting that treatment um, provided to you. So getting your valve replaced or repaired, um, getting a, a clip for the valve, um, and then um, following you through. So they're very similar, the research arm of what we're doing versus the traditional therapy mirror each other very closely. There are a few big differences um, as far as follow-ups and stuff. We tend to follow you at 30, uh, one week, 30 days, and one year. Research, of course, because you're in a study, can go on for many years. Um, and then again, just in the end, that research is, once the research is completed, that information is published and then sent on to the FDA for hopefully approval. Again, so what do you do? Talk to your doctor. Talk to whoever's referred you. Find out what your op um, options are and become knowledgeable by attending events like this. You can also reach out to us uh, via our website, MinneapolisHeart.org. Um, and if you haven't, connect with us in the back as well. Thank you. Okay, so the first question is involving if someone has had, this is a good one, if someone has had a prior open heart surgery, can they in the future, should they need it, be a candidate for a minimally invasive transcatheter procedure? And the short answer is likely yes. Obviously, depending upon what they've had in the past, but we do have technology to put in a minimally invasive, for example, aortic valve and a prior surgical aortic valve even a transcatheter mitral valve inside a prior surgical mitral valve. And so the, the short answer is just because you've had open heart surgery in the past doesn't automatically preclude you. Yeah, um, the same problem one patient is asking, uh, this patient had a prior aortic valve replacement in 2014. Now her uh, aortic valve is not working that great. Um, um, the patient provides some numbers. Uh, uh, 
probably moderate to severe new aortic stenosis. Uh, so the patient is asking, what are the strategies? Um, two questions. Um, any blood thinning medication for this condition? Um, or maybe a CT scan to see if there's any thrombosis risk. So uh, if your aortic valve is getting narrow again, um, it's going to depend of your symptoms um, and, and then um, your, maybe your size or the size of the prior aortic valve that the, you had uh, uh, about, about a new intervention. Um, so Dr. Soli just mentioned, if you had a prior aortic valve replacement and uh, your valve is not working well, our first approach right now is doing a new uh, aortic valve replacement through the groin using transcatheter options. Um, uh, but also it's going to depend on the, your valve site. If the, in the first, during the first surgery, your surgeon used a large valve that make easier for transcatheter options. If your aortic annulus was a small and they use a small valve, might be difficult. So you might be considering undergoing for a second open heart surgery. Um, and then you may want to take this, this uh, question, Nista. Do you do CT scan in this condition? Um, and uh, do you recommend blood thinner medications, such as copter uh, plavix? Yeah, so that's a good, good question. We do have the ability to uh, perform a CAT scan on patients if we're concerned that the, uh, there is blood clot or thrombus on any of the surgical valves or the transcatheter valves. And a 4D CT scan, which is a, a four-dimensional scans that we have these days, allow us to really understand the function of that valve. And sometimes, as Dr. Olivares mentioned, we do a short-term blood thinner <laughs> to see if that blood thinner will break up the, the blood clot that's on the valve and sort of get the valve back to uh, its normal function. Right. Yes, absolutely. So my question I have is uh, mitral valve regurgitation, mild going into moderate, what are limits for exercise? And my advice is that you should not adjust your lifestyle just because your regurgitation goes from mild to moderate. You should actually continue to live a normal life and if you're having a hard time keeping up with your normal activities, that is a signal that your body is telling you that your valve is kind of reaching the point where it is affecting normal function, it's affecting how your body feels, and you have to look into it more. Just because your valve regurgitation progresses does not mean alone that you need to slow down. Slowing down on your exercise will not prevent it from getting worse, and it's also a signal for you to know when is the right time to actually go ahead and replace your valve or look more into uh, what options we have about fixing your valve. But otherwise, normal physical activity, if you're able to tolerate it, is a sign that your body can live with uh, the amount of regurgitation that you're having. Um, my question is, if we are connected to M Health Fairview, how do we go about switching to Alina Health um, or Northwest Heart Clinic? Um, Call us. <laughs> um, the big thing is, again, a lot of us, a lot of our treatments and therapies are um, covered by insurance, and that kind of dictates the pathway um, of where you can go and who you can see. But it never hurts to just call us, and we can help you navigate that and determine if we're able to take you on and guide you. So, a few questions upon how do we decide or if we can do the procedure through the wrist, through the leg, and if we need to use both legs. So it largely all depends upon what we're doing. Uh, these days we can do what's called a, a heart catheterization or a coronary angiogram, which was on one of the videos that Dr. Oliveira showed. That uh, uh, test is designed to look at the blood arteries to see if there are any blockages. And that procedure can be done potentially through the radial artery via the wrist. And the way that we determine if the wrist can be utilized or the leg artery can be utilized is by using ultrasound, because ultrasound helps us determine what the vessel size is to help determine if the equipment can pass up the arm to get to the heart arteries. And similarly, for transcatheter valve procedures, as Dr. Oliveris had shown in his segment, we use the CAT scan to look to see, are the leg arteries big enough? Is the aorta big enough? What, are the, what does the valve look like? To see if that equipment, uh, some of which are in the back for you guys to take a look at, 
uh, can actually go up and be amenable to going without opening up the chest. So we very largely do use the CAT scan to help determine uh, which artery to use, which side to use, uh, the wrist to use, and largely depends upon what we're doing. When we do TAVR, we need a access point for the valve and then the other equipment. And that other equipment generally goes on the opposite leg artery, and that includes a temporary pacemaker for the procedure and then something to help guide the procedure. And so we are constantly, uh, before we even get into the room, with that CAT scan and with ultrasound, sort of uh, have an idea of which points of access we'll be utilizing. One more question. There's one more patient with a prior mitral valve replacement. Uh, is 14 years old, um, the valve. Um, so the patient is asking, when should she, uh, the patient get a new one? And uh, what is the uh, blue book value for this 14 uh, <laughs> years old valve? <laughs> well, uh, it depends. If you, had it done, yeah. if you had your surgery done with Dr. <laughs> Oliveris, you're good to go for a million miles. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, it depends. If your initial surgery, the surgeon used a tissue valve, um, uh, the reason to do an intervention is going to depend on two factors. One, symptoms, and then secondly, how, how narrow is your current valve. Uh, if, if you have symptoms and your, your mitral valve is very narrow, what we, can, we can, what we can offer to you is a transcatheter option replacing that valve to the groin, if it's a tissue valve. But if it's a mechanical valve, mechanical valve are those valves made by very resistant material called uh, carbon, and um, we can, those valves are not amenable to do uh, transcatheter options. So if that valve is not working well, we may need a second open heart surgery. Usually tissue valve may last, a mitral position may last 10 to 15 years. Depend, it depends on your size. It depends on your type of valve that the prior surgeon used. Um, there's many, many factors. But I would say for mitral position, probably, um, 75% of the patients are free of reintervention at, fi at 15 years. So your, your valve is good too. It's, good. it's still good. <laughs> uh, I have a great question here. If a patient has been diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis and severe regurgitation, if that patient also, and that patient ha also has a history of atrial fibrillation treated with ablation and a pacemaker, could they still be a candidate for TAVR or is SAVR the only option? The short answer is that it's very likely he can be a candidate for both options, both surgery as well as TAVR. A lot of the things of what we do is assess every patient independently. That's why we do a lot of the imaging testing. We'll do an echo, we'll do a CT, uh, we'll do a cath to collect all the information. And then we sit down all together as a team. So it's not a one person decision, it's a team decision. We assess the anatomy, we, use a, we work a lot with our surgical partners like Dr. Olivares. We, use, uh, we work a lot with our imaging team, so we analyze the CT, we analyze the echo, and we try to make a decision of what's gonna be the best long-term option for the patient. So we'll look at both options, we'll look at uh, anatomical factors, and uh, we also weigh in what's the patient's preference. If there's a uh, big preference for one over the other, we always take everything into consideration, and we try to come up with a solution that it's gonna be durable, it's gonna help the patient, serve the patient, and address all the problems, if possible, with one, uh, with one option and one procedure. So it kind of needs to be an individualized answer. Excellent. Okay, this one is shifting gears a little bit about holes in the heart. Uh, we have been predominantly talking about uh, valve disease, but a hole in the heart uh, can also occur as part of structural heart disease. And uh, depending upon the actual <coughs> hole in the heart, it may be something very benign that doesn't need to be followed, or it may be something that does need to be closed at some point. Uh, most oftentimes, when holes in the heart become relevant, uh, if they occur in the top chamber, what we're talking about is something called a patent frame and ovale, or a PFO, and that's just a, a fancy word for uh, a small hole in the two top chambers of the heart. About 25% of the population are born with that and they never even know that they may have that 
unless they have some sort of a stroke phenomenon, unfortunately, uh, and in that workup get diagnosed uh, with having uh, what's called a PFO. This becomes relevant particularly in young patients, such as 20s, 30s, who really have otherwise no uh, reason to have had a stroke. And if the workup suggests that there really truly is no other reason, but they have this type of hole in the heart, we do have technology where we can put in a device, an umbrella-like device, to help close that hole in the heart. One, one patient is asking for, um, he had an aortic valve replacement and now he, he's experienced uh, a prosthesis mismatch. And so he's asking, is this going to shorten the, the valve life expectancy? And the short answer is yes, it might short your life exp expectancy of your valve. And then um, mismatch usually happen when the valve that the surgeon use is small for your size. So you may experience symptoms again in a short period of time. Um, we have a few surgical techniques to deal with that situation when patient has very small aortic annulus. And always our goal is using the largest valve possible to avoid this phenomenon. But if that happens, intervention is going to depend on your symptoms and, um, and uh, your age and your comorbidities. Um, for those patients, we may have also uh, transcatheter options um, if, if you are old with many comorbidities. Perfect. Uh, I have a question and something that frequently comes up, especially in clinic, and it's about pacemaker and whether that's always needed after a TAVR procedure. So as uh, Dr. Sodi was showing the example of the house, and it's, that's something I frequently use when, when I see my patients in clinic, our heart is like a house. So it does have the doors, which are the valves. It does have pipes, which is our coronary arteries, and it also has electrical wires. And the main electrical wire of the heart is transversing right behind the aortic valve. So sometimes when we do put uh, our new valve, the contact between the new valve and that area can irritate the um, electrical wire of the heart. Does this mean that all the patients that undergo TAVR will need a permanent pacemaker? The answer is no. About 90% of the patient will not require a pacemaker, and that's all the data we have from our clinical trials over, uh, over years, and that's something we are continuously, like, continue to monitor that to make sure that we maintain those great levels. Um, there is a lot of progress that has happened in our valve designs. There is a lot of progress and has happened on how do we implant our valves to make sure we minimize the amount of contact to make sure we preserve the area and make sure we don't have, uh, we don't have the need for the pacemaker. So short answer is no, not all the patients we need it. For sure you will get a temporary pacemaker during the procedure because that comes to uh, the way we deploy the valve, but most of the times that pacemaker comes out at the end of the procedure and you'll be able to go home the next day. And then a few questions actually about uh, clinical trial and research. So we uh, have an esteemed retired clinical researcher in our audience, so thank you for this. Uh, and I did want to um, also just encourage and sort of make the point that you know, in terms of how do, we, how do we get access to clinical trials or how do we come to understanding what those options are and what's available, really the first step is um, coming to Valve Clinic and sort of coming and getting evaluated by the full team. And then during that conversation, understanding is it a surgical option that may be better? Is it a transcatheter option that may be better? Uh, or is it uh, one of our alternative clinical trials that we have? or is it simply continuing medical therapy for the time being? And so during that visit, we try to really go through all of the options for patients. And if there is a clinical trial that would be helpful, we have a clinical trial research team, uh, Coley, Grant, and our whole foundation. We have a whole army of people that come talk to patients about what what does it look like to be screened in a clinical trial from a, from a screening standpoint, from a cost standpoint, from an insurance standpoint, uh, and uh, if they screen, what does that time frame look like? Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, it goes without saying that 
any sensitive patient health information is all remains confidential in any sort of a clinical trial and really in any sort of healthcare. Um, just because you participate in a clinical trial, your sort of personal health information is still protected. And the team does a very good job of ensuring that. And there are a lot of obviously check marks uh, in a trial in regards to screening, enrollment, uh, procedural aspects, and follow up. Uh, and so, uh, two things I would say about clinical trials. One is sometimes it is the hope that a patient needs because there is no other option. And the second is it, sound, it can sound scary and investigational and the unknown, but really truly a lot of these devices have already been tested in our higher risk patients and we're now looking at them in intermediate risk patients. Uh, and then the, the other piece is your clinical, the clinical trial team is with you every step of the way, as well as the medical team that's taking care of you. And so it, um, we try to ease that uh, process as best as we can. Uh, and then for our very grateful patient that's in the audience, um, thank you for your gratitude uh, and question about uh, making a, a gift. We do have the foundation uh, in the back there, uh, uh, and Lynn, I believe, is also with us, along with Chris Fortman, who run the foundation. And so thank you for that very generous comment uh, and gesture. Uh, let's see if there's any more. That we there, there was one, one question about rheumatic disease um, and mitral regurgitation yeah. and the I High diastolic blood pressure, yeah. Yeah, so there is a question that came in that yeah. is there any correlation with rheumatic fever causing a mitral valve regurgitation and a high diastolic pressure? Um, it, so a rheumatic disease is a very special condition. Um, uh, it's very unlikely to happen here in the U.S., but when that happens, it's secondary to throat infection that inflamed the mitral, the mitral valve, and over the course of the years, that valve became stenotic or narrow. Uh, that is the most likely uh, sequence. Uh, in some patients, in the early stage, may cause also uh, some uh, regurgitation, leaky valve. Um, and if that related to the high uh, diastolic blood pressure, maybe if the patient is fluid overload. Yeah. Um, for rheumatic disease, um, though we have one uh, great option, trancatheter option called ballon plasty, that they, they can put a balloon inside the valve, they can, they can uh, uh, re-expand the valve again. If, uh, if that fail over time, we can always do open heart surgery to fix your, your, your mitral valve. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another question here asking about valve failures in general, and if a valve is not working, a documented diagnosis, why wait and watch? Why not go into corrective surgery? How bad does a valve have to get before surgery? Does insurance coverage have anything to do with timing? Uh, Short answer is that just because something is starting to wear off doesn't mean that you need to change it. Uh, it's, uh, there are stages in how severely our valves are failing or not, and it might take actually years or decades to progress from one stage to the other. So just because with age and uh, years something starts to leak a little bit or become a little tight, does it mean that it needs to be replaced because it might continue to work for the next 10, 15 years without causing any issues to your body and causing any uh, issues affecting your daily activities? Uh, when it starts getting more severely uh, affected, that's when things kind of start to expedite. And that's when your body will start being affected and that's when your daily activities will start being affected because your body will not be able to get enough blood and maintain its normal functions. And that's where shortness of breath, uh, uh, like swelling, uh, fatigue start to kick in, and that's the moment where we start discussing about replacing things or repairing things. Um, so we do have a lot of knowledge over the years from clinical trials, from uh, longitudinals like data that we've looked into uh, to know uh, how long does years, how many years does it take. And we have strong uh, societal also uh, recommendations on when should we uh, actually replace things, and that's when things come into play. So just because you get your echo report and you see that you have some mild thickening or some mild leakage doesn't automatically mean that you need to replace it. That's something that's normal. Our body will, like, as years progress, will start feeling the effect of it, and that's not something that automatically needs to be replaced. Uh, for the insurance part, 
most of the things we do are actually covered by commercial insurances. So there is recommendations, not in order to uh, limit our ability to do things, but also to make sure that people don't start replacing things on right when it's not indicated. So uh, it's not a factor, it's more of uh, making sure that uh, things are done the right way. I think that's such an important point about things being done the right way. Be, uh, and really, at the end of the day, you know, even this question too is about uh, someone who's had a few uh, valve replacements many, many years ago and asking about danger if, if the valve needs to be replaced again. And really, I think sort of, I think the takeaway, if you will, is that, you know, every patient, every one of you is unique. Every patient has a unique story, a unique background. And what we all would encourage is that if you do notice something in your health, to, to speak up to your either primary care and get referred and, and come and spend the time to have that conversation and get that evaluation done to just even understand the options. And it's our responsibilities as physicians, as nurses, and as the whole team taking care of you to really get to understand you, what your goals are, what your family's goals are, and what symptoms you are and how best we can treat you. And then we work together as a team to come up with options and then present that with you. And that is really the beauty of what is called shared decision making, where that decision Decision is something that you as the patient ultimately get to make um, as an advocate for your own health care and in, in what is best for you. And so there's never any hard or fast rules, I would say. It's all just sort of a, a conversation that depends upon the workup and really what each patient wants as, the, as their goal. And I think with that, we may be at the hour. Okay. Unless anyone has any burning last questions. <laughs> So we do many of them, uh, many of them a day, many of them a week. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, some of us uh, devote almost all of our time to doing this. So, uh, you know, this isn't a, a once in a month type thing. We do some of these three or four in a day, depending upon what we're doing, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, multiple times a week. Yeah. yeah. begins to enlarge or, um, you know, problems with the heart itself, even if there's not any symptoms before you decide something needs to be done? Yes, I think that's a beautiful, that's a great question. We do. So part of the echocardiogram and the CT that you're seeing is, and this is a lot of the things we put into the equation, is not only looking at your valves, they look at, we look at the structure of your heart. So is your ventricle enlarging? Is the atrium, which is the upper part of your uh, heart, enlarging? Is your, uh, uh, the squeezing ability of your heart, is it getting affected? Um, so a lot of the things, uh, we collect a lot of different information, individual for every person, that we always weigh in trying to make the best decision in combination as a team as well as with the patient and uh, find out the best uh, solution uh, 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 as a total. And that team includes your primary care physician and even your primary cardiologist. It's very important that we have that communication uh, and make sure that you know nothing is done in silo. So we always try to communicate back to your primary care physician and the team that referred you so that everyone knows what's going on. Because oftentimes, uh, patients' primary care has known them for years, and we're just meeting them for the first time. And so we do try to keep that continuity of care uh, and that communication also back to, to where the patient is coming from. Okay, in the spirit of this of staying on time, this will be our last question, okay? But I'm gonna give you the mic. What is currently going on in clinical valve research that has not been FDA approved yet? <laughs> so a lot of things. How much time do we have? <laughs> so just, uh, I guess, a plug. In the last two weeks, uh, the, uh, there are two uh, technologies for the tricuspid valve, which we didn't really delve into today, but that were FDA approved, that the foundation and our colleagues have been really sort of actively been working on over the last couple of years. One is the triluminate trial, which is the paperclip-like device on the tricuspid side, which Abbott Northwestern under Dr. Paul Siraj's leadership was one of the highest enrollers in the world, if not the country. 
Uh, the second that was FDA approved is a replacement device on the tricuspid valve called Evoke. And so those, um, you know, it's the beauty of research where we work on this in clinical trial and just in the last two weeks we now have approval for, for these patients to now not having to be in a clinical trial and can come and uh, get their tricuspid valve treated. Briefly, in the interest of time, there is mitral valve replacement technology that we are actively investigating, as well as uh, repair technology, uh, as well as on the pulmonic valve side. And then our interventional heart failure for our congestive heart failure patients, there's a, a whole breadth uh, as well. And I, I believe we have a um, foundation table in the back that probably has, you know, step by step for you as well. So with that, I think we'll say thank you. Yeah.